Welcome once again, Grade 12s. Today we're going to continue with our transactional writing texts and we are going to focus on the report, both the formal and the informal report. What is a report? A report can be a document that is based on evidence requested by an individual or authority within or outside an organization or company. A report can be both formal and informal. So by implication, it means that there is feedback, firstly, and secondly, that there has to be some kind of research or reflection that has to be conducted about a particular aspect of the work, uh, if it is indeed in the workplace, or if it is certain practices that are being assessed. We will tackle the formal report first. So what is the purpose of a formal report? It is to inform and not to persuade or entertain a particular audience. It is also factual and it is compiled for a prescribed authority. Now what does that mean? What does prescribed authority mean? It means that it is, has been, you have been instructed as the researcher to conduct the research and to write the report by somebody in authority, for example, it can be the CEO of a company who needs to um, find out um, how successful the company is. It can be the principal of a school who has instructed you uh, to compile a report, for example, on aspects that might concern, um, be of concern, for example, like bullying at the school or sport participation. So as you can see, it has to have a specified format and it is based on an established procedure. And that procedure and format is something that we are going to look at in the subsequent paragraphs. Therefore, your report must be firstly concise. It means short and to the point. It must be accurate. It must be based on the research and findings and statistics, etc. It must be unbiased. That means it must be objective. And once you've gathered all your evidence, which you have based on research, your readers will then be able to make an informed decision based on the information or material that you have collected and collated as well as reported on. Now, let's say your teacher has um, given you the following topic. You were commissioned by the chairperson of the local community centre to compile a report on the degree of bullying amongst girls at your school. So where do you start? How indeed do you collect the information? You need to firstly identify how and when you are going to conduct your research. You need to choose your sample. So what is a sample? A sample is normally 10% normally of your population. For example, in this case, it is 10% of the school population. For obvious reasons, um, logistically, it is impossible to conduct research and include the entire population because your population, population could run into millions. So you need to be selective and also for practical reasons, you only take a percentage of your entire population on which to base your findings. You also need to make sure that you choose individuals from across the different grades. In this case, you're lucky because you're only doing female, so that part is obvious. And then you also need to look at the different responses of girls from different ages because it might be, they might have a different response. For example, uh, perhaps, let's speculate, uh, grade 8 girls might experience more bullying than your more senior girls because your more senior girls might be more confident and also um, might be more assertive as well. What you do next is you draw up your questionnaire. Now, what is your questionnaire? It's a list of questions which you will decide on and you will, you, the questions must speak to the issue that you are researching. You then disseminate or hand out your questionnaire to the recipients who, have, who will have to complete it. Now, you can decide if your recipient, that is the person who is going to complete the form or the survey, if they are going to do so anonymously without putting their names down or if they're going to have to include their names. 
You then sort out your responses and based on your responses, you then draw your conclusions. Once you have all that information, then you will compile your report. Now, I know it is a much and it's a lot to take in. So what I'm going to do in the next few slides is going to try and break it down into its simplest forms and explain each step in graphic detail. As mentioned in the preceding slide, the formal report has a specified format. So how do you start? You'll start with your title and so you will write the word title. Use a colon and then you will state what issue it is that you are addressing in your research and at which venue, if indeed it is limited to a particular venue or to a particular geographical region uh, that you've conducted research. Your second heading then will be for attention. What does this mean? It means here you indicate the name and the person and surname of the person who requested you to complete the report and to do the necessary research. So you're going to say uh, Mr. and Mrs. who they the name and the surname as well as the capacity. For example, in this case, it is the chairperson of the local community centre. Your third heading then is your terms of reference, which provides the reader with a context. This context refers to who the individual is and what the background is and possibly what the reasons are for requesting this particular report. So here's an example. And as in the other um, headings that I've included here, you could possibly use this, the standard format when you complete your own report. But remember, you must include the headings as indicated on the slide in front of you. For example, the first one is your title, then for attention, third one is your terms of reference. So here's an example once again. As requested by the local community chairperson, this report investigates the degree of bullying at whatever uh, location it is. Once again, just a reminder, in this case, it is a school. So you've indicated your title, your second heading is for attention, number three, your point number three is your terms of reference, and your point number four then is the procedure. And your procedure may be written in point form, so what do you indicate in the procedure? The procedure is the process that you followed in order to conduct your survey. It informs the reader of the manner in which you conducted your survey, what tool did you use and how did you disseminate um, or spread the questionnaires, for example, if you're going to use a questionnaire and how you collected the information. A survey was drawn up by, and here again, it's the name of the individual. Um, which includes you and also your capacity, for example, if you are the RCL chairperson or if you are any other um, representative of an organization or institution, which included questions on, here you mentioned the matter being investigated. The questionnaires were handed out by, so here you indicate who handed it out. If it's a school scenario, then it would, could possibly be class teachers and two, that would be your specimen group that you are going to use, your sample group. So you will indicate who, who the learners are who received the questionnaires. You then mention the, question, the responses were collected by, the individual collected the responses and the results were collated and analyzed. So what is the difference between something being collected and something being collated. If you collect something, you just take them in, but when you collate them, you organize them according to certain requirements that you wish to identify. For example, you could collate them and organize them in terms of the ages of the girls, in this case at the school, or you also could do it in terms of the different class groupings. 
that they are for example you could have the grade nines in a separate um, category as the grade tens and the grade elevens as well you have collected collated and analyzed your information based on your surveys so now you have to write your findings and what exactly is your findings here yeah, you have to report on the results by using percentages and you may write this in point four there are two examples below let's say for example if you handed out a survey and asked 10 learners to respond to the following question have you ever been bullied at school if six learners stated no, that they have not experienced bullying at school, and four learners indicate that they have experienced bullying, then out of 10, you would then say that four out of 10 is 40% and six out of 10 is 60%. And that is how you draw your conclusion as far as your percentages is concerned. So for the survey that we have done as an example, um, our findings for this particular example that we've used is that 22% of grade 8 pupils reported that they are being bullied, while only 3% of grade 11 learners experience bullying. So there then is your example. So now what do you do once you have your findings? You move on to your next category, and this is your conclusion. So what is your conclusion? Your conclusion is based on your findings. And this means that you, are, you now have analyzed the information and you have come to some sort of understanding and conclusion which has been presented to you based on the findings. For example, in this survey that we are using as an example, the results reveal that the minority of girls at the school have experienced bullying. Because remember, it's only 22% of grade 8 pupils and 3% and of grade 11 pupils. So it's only a small percentage of the girls at the school in total. The older girls in grade 11 reported a much lower percentage of bullying than the grade 8s. And so you're now comparing the responses of the two different groups. You could add some kind of comment on this, these findings and state these findings could suggest that and here um, you could add any additional comments that you wish to add which is based on the the conclusion and the findings itself then you your your um your seventh point or seventh category or heading is your recommendations and here you indicate uh, strategies that can be used to implement or improve the situation. Remember, when you are given that instruction by, for example, your principal or by um, an established authority uh, to do a survey and to write a report, you're not merely being tested on your report writing skills. What you, what they wish to find out is uh, how where the gaps are in the organization and how they can improve um, on service delivery for example or how they can improve whatever mechanisms are in place or make things better in this case to stop bullying um, at a particular school by the time you have to make your recommendations you have basically virtually reached the end of your report and so it is important that you sign off your report because remember you have been instructed to write a report by a person in authority and you have been assigned to complete this task in an official capacity and so you have to sign off. Remember that the report is written not only so that uh, the individual in authority can assess your report writing skills, it is the person in authority, prescribed authority, instructs another person in a particular capacity to do ne the necessary research to identify whatever gaps there are in an organization or whatever problems there are, so that once the report has been completed and the recommendations have been forwarded, 
Those recommendations can be implemented so that there can be improvement, for example, in the service delivery or in eradicating the problem. And in this case, the problem is bullying among girls at a particular school. Just a little recap for you. If you are going to decide to do the actual formal report, remember, it's not such a, a daunting task because there are at least seven headings that you need to include in your report. Um, they are, for example, firstly, you remember your title, then for attention, then thirdly, your terms of reference, fourth, your procedure, fifth, your findings, sixth, your conclusion, seventh, your recommendation, and lastly, do not forget your signature uh, with your, your, your name and your surname as well as the date so that you can officially sign off and hand the report over to the prescribed authority. So now it is your turn. Here is the topic uh, that has been extracted from an exam question paper. You are the captain of one of the teams in the sports club you belong to. I write a report to the chairperson of the club reflecting on your, your team's performance during the past season. So one of the questions you have to ask yourself is the following. Are you going to do the formal report or are you going to do the informal report? And if you're going to do the formal report, there are prescribed headings and there is a prescribed format. But what if you decide to do the informal report? Remember, um, it is not as prescriptive as the formal report is. We are now on to slide number 11. Imagine you've decided that you are going to tackle this topic as an uh, informal report. So what should you know about informal reports? Informal reports are written for person-to-person -person communication within a company or an organization. So yes, it is still uh, uh, instructed or you are still instructed by a person in authority to write this particular report, but it is not as structured and as um, rigid as the formal report. That being said, the format of the informal report is quite fluid because it does not um, ascribe to a set format or a particular set of rules. And uh, you need to decide what you are going to include as headings. And this is based on the nature and the content of your particular report. So remember, for example, a report on an excursion to a museum in the city will have different headings and content um, that a, an informal report, for example, of a metric camp might have. And so each report will have its own set of headings. Your tone in this case may be personal, as the tone in the formal report is more neutral and or detached even. That then brings us to an end to our discussion on the formal and the informal report. If you are given a question in the examination and you have to decide which report to, to, go, to use uh, for a particular question, read the, and analyze the question quite closely. If the examiner does not instruct you that it is a formal report, then by implication, you can also choose to write an informal report. So note the differences. Formal report is based on research and findings and has a prescribed structure. And the informal report is quite informal in nature. And it doesn't have a set structure, but it will have its own iconic headings and aspects that you need to look at. But remember, both reports need to have a heading. It is written for somebody in some kind of authority, so you need to have a, a, um, a title there, for example, for attention, um, for obvious reasons. You also need to have recommendations, because in those cases, a report is um, required so that you can reflect on current practices in order to find solutions to whatever problems there are or in order to ensure that you continue with the positive uh, practices or good practices that currently exist. You also, in conclusion, you need to actually sign 
often make sure you include the name and the surname as well as the signature and importantly the date of the individual who has compiled and written this particular report.